Good morning. Open your Bibles to Galatians 5, 26. We are still in our series called Toxic, Healing from Poisonous Relationships. And here's the scripture we're looking at this morning. Galatians 5, 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions, then they can can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. Together with you. Um, how many of you, raise your hand again, if uh, this is your first Sunday with us? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Almost half of you. 40% of you. I'm excited that you're here with us. Um, we are going to spend some time in Galatians uh, chapter 5, so make sure that you're there. 5, the very last verse there, and then all the way into uh, to chapter 6. We've been talking about toxic relationships, all right? Toxic, how do you heal poisonous relationships? Uh, my sister Colette and I, she had done some triathlons down in Southern California. I had done some triathlons in Northern California, but we had never done one together. And so we thought, you know, wouldn't it be fun if we did a triathlon together? So July 16th, 2015, that was going to be the race. The race was this. Up in Santa Rosa, they do this thing called the Vine Man. And there's like a full Iron Man Vine Man, and then there's like a half Iron Man. We were going to do the half Iron Man race. Just in case you don't know what is involved in that, it's a 1.2 mile swim in the Russian River. Then you transition from swimming in a river to hopping on a bike, and it's 56 miles on a bike through this beautiful wine country. And then when you're done with the swim and then the bike, then there's a 13.1 mile run, a little half marathon at the end of that race. That's 70.3 miles of just pure fun, right? And so that was something that we were going to do together. Now, at this race, the Russian River is not very big. I mean, the place where we were swimming, it looked like the Russian Creek. I mean, it's, it's just not very big. So they stagger your start times. And so I was going to start about 8 in the morning, and her wave would start about 30 minutes behind mine. Now, I had a few advantages over my sister in this race. Um, one is, I had done this race previously, so I knew the course. I knew that where the hills were, kind of knew what it looked like, and so that gives you a little bit of an advantage. The other is this. I had done this distance before. It wasn't my first half Ironman, but she had never done that distance. She'd done a bunch more triathlons than me, but a lot shorter distance. So um, I did what every good brother should do, right? As her older brother, I, I gave her really, really good advice about how, how not to stink at this race, right? On, on how to finish this thing and finish strong. Um, and by the way, it's not like she and I were racing against each other, right? We're just doing the same race together. So <clears throat> I go off and I go through these, uh, these three different types of uh, swimming, biking, running. I get to the end, <clears throat> and I just can't explain the kind of feeling you get. That as, as you see the finish line ahead, and you just start, you just you pick up pace, and you just, there's all kinds of energy and life in you that you didn't have the, the last mile back, and I, I can see my parents there, I can see Kelly there, I can see the kids there, uh, I can see my brother-in-law, <clears throat> Rod, they're all around the finish line, and I crossed the line, and I just felt really good. I mean, I had energy, I didn't feel like, you know, there's no cramping, no injuries, no crashes, right? I mean, I had a pretty decent race, so now we wait. We wait for my sister, Colette, wondering how far back is she? I mean, 15 minutes passes, 20 minutes passes, and before we know it, we can see her coming down the stretch. Like, she's looking strong, and she's running hard, and we're like, oh, this, is, this is amazing. Um, she finished with a time of five hours, 19 minutes and 30 seconds, which is fantastic. And so we all celebrated together. I think you'll, that's she and I at the race, just right at the very end, she finished, and it was awesome. Then I was like, well, wow, she did 
five hours, 19 minutes, and 30 seconds. I was like, I didn't even check. Like, how fast did I go? She beat me. Like, don't be clapping. She meet, beat me by one minute and nine seconds. I had some options at that point, right? What ran through my head, or could have run through my head but didn't, was, are those times accurate? Are, are they really, are those really the right times? And then I, I could have run through, could have, didn't, could have run through all of the, the reasons, also known as excuses, as to why I wasn't faster. You see, coming off the bike, I came off the bike, found my, my transition stuff, and got ready for the run, and I ran by this porta potty. And it was just like this instinctive reaction, like, oh yeah, I should go to the bathroom. Listen, <clears throat> that took me more than a minute and nine seconds. And so I'm just telling you, I would have been faster, but my, but my bowels betrayed me on this race. <clears throat> I would have beat her, but <clears throat> I didn't feel like going through those excuses were probably um, a really good thing. And I had the opportunity to go, well, I don't feel so good about the race I just run. Like a minute ago, I was feeling pretty decent about it. Like, hey, I finished, the, <clears throat> then it got to the finish line, and I was feeling good, and I feel like I'd done my best. And, but in that moment where you're like, wait, 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 she finished before me. And when we compared our two times, all of a sudden I had a moment where I could feel not as excited, uh, maybe even a little jealous. The truth is this, <clears throat> and this is what I did. I was just like, no, 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 no. I'm going to push that back, and I'm just going to tell myself the truth. And the truth is this. My sister's a beast. How many of you get to say that about your sister and it not be offensive, right? She's just a beast, and she's just fast. And so I did the really mature thing. I ran up. I gave her a hug, said congratulations, way to run a good race. And I did throw in there, I must have given you some amazing advice for you to do that well. <clears throat> And I would love to tell you that it's just in those environments that the comparison trap comes out in me. But it's not. Can I be real honest with you? When you pastor a church and you go away to an annual conference and you start meeting other pastors that you don't know, or you go to meetings around the city and you start meeting some other pastors, eventually, <clears throat> excuse me, eventually the conversation starts creeping towards this comparison. And you might not know this. I'm going to share this about pastors. It's not true of every pastor, but it's true for a lot of pastors. If they get caught into this comparison trap, they compare the three Bs. Here they are. Budgets, buildings, and butts. Budgets. <clears throat> so, well, how much do you deal with on an annual basis? Like, how much, what's your budget for the year? It's just a weird question to ever ask anybody. I never ask another pastor that question. Buildings, how many sites does your church have? Multi-sites? How, how big is the building that you're in? And then they count butts. Butts in the seats. Uh, how many people attend your church? And it's so interesting that if you feel different about yourself in the moment that you realize that the person you're talking to has a more, the bigger three Bs than you, Right? They have a bigger budget, more buildings, and not a bigger butt, but they have more butts in the seats, right? <laughs> if you start feeling inferior about yourself in that moment, you have just fallen into the comparison trap. Now, I'm just being honest with you, okay? I hope my vulnerability, though, will help you look at yourself and ask this question. What kind of comparison trap do you fall into? Because I don't think it's just in triathlons. I don't think it's just when I meet with other pastors. I think the comparison trap is always around me. Where I'm tempted to feel superior at some moments. I mean, if I go to a triathlon event and I'm around some friends that run races and do this kind of thing with me, and I'm faster than them, do I feel more superior and better about myself? Do you feel superior on your team at work when you're like the highest paid person on your team? or the most gifted, or you know more about the project that you're going to do than anyone else, do you feel superior? Or do you feel inferior or intimidated when you walk into that project and you're like, whoa, these, are, these people are above me on the org chart. These people make more money than me. These people actually know more about this project than I do. If that is true, here's the reality. You've fallen into the comparison trap. Here's where we're headed with this. The comparison trap toxifies our relationships by making us feel superior 
inferior or intimidated. <clears throat> I was just looking at an article just the other day, and it, it's this story about a, a mom and a dad, and the mom, <clears throat> she really loves packing her third grader's lunch. I mean, you can tell it's not a story from this area, right? Because no third grader's going to school right now. <laughs> packs her daughter's lunch, and she loves just being extravagant and fun and taking the food and making something fun out of it. <clears throat> they got a call from their teacher and said, hey, would you stop doing that? Would you stop having so much fun with your third grader's lunch? Because when the other kids don't get to have that kind of extravagant lunch, it might make them feel bad. So we live in this world where everybody has to have the exact same thing. Because we don't want anybody to feel bad. You know what that is? That's our world falling into the comparison trap. When someone has something nice or better than we have, why can't we celebrate and go, wow, that's great, instead of going, wow, I'm envious, or wow, I'm jealous. We all have this. So question, what's your comparison trap? It might be in your workplace. It could be in your church. Let me say it this way. I know there's some people, they don't join a community group because of this. They don't want, they don't want to be embarrassed at, at, at how little of the Bible that they really understand and know. And I can tell you, man, our community groups really are a safe place. But listen, that's the comparison trap because you feel inferior in that place. But the reality is, is there's all kinds of ty types of people that you might feel inferior around if someone makes more money than you. Maybe academics is the deal. I mean, you go to school, and when you're there, the people who get better grades than you, you're like, oh, I wish I was them. I don't feel good when I'm around them. Instead of, man, make friends with them. They can help you. <laughs> or maybe you hang out with the people who are not as smart as you because you feel better about yourself. Maybe around the workplace. I don't know how you, uh, those with advanced degrees, you shy away from because you're like, they might bring up something and talk about something. I mean, man, talk about a number of engineers in this valley, and they start talking about stuff. I'm like, I have no idea what they're talking about, and they just know that now, so I don't even worry about it. But what happens when you feel intimidated at work because of that? We know that we've fallen into this comparison trap. Let me say it this way. If your opinion about yourself changes, how you see yourself, how you value what, you're ha what you have or who you are, if it changes to either feel superior or inferior based off of the people that you're with, it's a sure sign that you have fallen into this comparison trap. And this is what Paul, he's talking about in the scriptures. Take a look at this. Chapter 5, verse 26, it says this. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. That's how it starts. Look at how it ends. Verse 4 of chapter 6. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. So here's the bookends of this that I'm going to try and make sense of right now. Conceited. Conceited is this. I'm doing great compared to you. Isn't that interesting? Provoking. Why aren't you doing more compared to me? Envying. I don't measure up compared to you. All three of those words, they start in chapter 5, verse 26, right? And what he bookends it with is, don't compare yourselves to others. All three of those words are about a comparison trap that we fall into. There's another word for this comparison trap. It's called keeping score. This series that we're talking about from Galatians, it doesn't necessarily talk about marriage. It's not actually the relationships he's referring to. He's actually referring to a church where they had these toxic relationships. You remember he said, I want you to love one another? And, but if you don't love one another, you're going to bite and devour each other. And if you do that, you're going to destroy each other. He's talking about church relationships. And the reality is, is we kind of keep score sometimes. In our marriages, for sure. Hey, I've done the dishes this many times. I've contributed this financially. Hey, I've cleaned up this room how many times? And by the way, we're never keeping score to see if we get better. We're like, last week I only did this three times. This week I did it four times, and I'm just getting better and better. That's not how we keep score in marriage, is it? No, we keep score against our spouse and how many times they did the dishes. If you're doing that, I'm just saying, you're in the comparison trap. So Paul gives us two answers. Are you ready? He tells us, don't do this. And then he says, 
here's something I want you to do. Don't do this, but I want you to engage in this. The first thing that he says is this, is um, verse 4, chapter 6. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone. Here it is, without comparing themselves to someone else. So here's his deep, amazing spiritual advice. If you're tempted to compare yourself to someone else, stop it. That's it. <laughs> just stop it. Just, just don't, don't do it. Now that's really, really hard. Like, hey, don't do that. That's usually rotten advice for someone. To just try and tell them, hey, just don't do that anymore. So we're fortunate because Paul, in his text here, he switches gears in verse 2. And he says this, here's what I want you to do to get out of the comparison trap. He says this, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. People will get overwhelmed in life, and they just feel like they cannot carry the stuff that weighs them down, and Paul calls it a burden. What are the burdens that overwhelm people? You might be surprised by some of this. In the example I'm going to give in just a moment, it's one of them is sin. When some of you, when someone gets caught, and I don't mean like surprised, like maybe they're surprised that they got caught in a lie. And they're like, I didn't realize I was lying. Sometimes they know they're lying and they got caught by someone else. It says you who are spiritual should restore them. So sometimes it's a sin. Can I say this? Sometimes the burdens that we carry that are overwhelming to us is an illness. We're just sick. And when our bodies betray us, oftentimes emotionally we get so down and we just can't do it anymore. For some, the burden that they carry is mental illness. For some, the burden that they carry is depression. For some, the burden that they carry is broken relationships where they just, they're not able to recover and they need somebody to come alongside them. Maybe it's a dysfunctional way that they relate to people. Like, why does that person keep getting angry? Do they know that that's like, they're a Christian, but that's not the fruit of the Spirit? And uh, do they know and see that in their life? Man, maybe they need a trusted friend to come alongside them and help them with that. Maybe it's a financial problem. We can have a lot of different burdens, but we know for sure is this. These burdens... They are not quickly resolved, so there's a weight that they can't carry alone, and it's going to take a while for them to recover from this. And last week as I was working this through, I was thinking, what, so what's the main point in this? Like, what's my thesis? What is Paul trying to communicate? And I was, I was going to say it this way. You can either compare yourself to people or carry their burdens, but you can't do both. You can either compare or you can carry, but you can't do both. And someone kindly pointed out, that ain't true. You can actually compare yourself to someone else and carry their burdens at the same time. And I'm going to call it this, toxic help. If you look in your notes there, I gave you the three things about being conceited uh, and and provoking and um, envious. And then there's this fourth category that I'm going to call toxic help, and it goes like this. I'm helping you because it actually helps me. I'm carrying your burden because I'm establishing my control, I'm establishing my worth, I'm establishing my social standing, and I'm establishing your indebtedness to me. Well, that doesn't sound very good, does it? It's not. It's falling into the comparison trap while helping at the same time. Some of you have the gift of helping, and that's awesome. Keep using it. But if you have the gift of helping, and you do it so that you feel superior, or you now feel worthy of love, or worthy of respect, you're still in the comparison trap, even though you're using your gifting. I'll say it a, a different way. If you love helping people, I mean, who doesn't, right? Well, there are some people. Um, (laughs) Most of us love helping people. But can I frame it this way? What if you despise being helped by others? 
You love being the one who's helping, but to receive help for someone to carry your burden with you, you're like, no, 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 no. It makes you feel inferior. I I should do this on my own. No, that's the comparison trap. The spiritually mature person is able to give their help, carry a burden. And when you end up carrying a burden, you can graciously allow people to come alongside you and carry your burden too. So, Here's what I want to talk through this morning. Healthy Christians carry burdens of others without falling into the comparison trap. Healthy Christians, they can carry burdens without comparing is essentially what I'm saying. So what are the signs that you're carrying without comparing? Let me give these to you real quick. Number one, you get involved in the rescue effort. If you go back to the text, what does it say? Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit, you should restore that person gently. Don't watch them struggle. Get in there and carry it with them. Now, in Paul's example, um, this person's caught in a sin. And listen, you have friends that you've earned the right to speak into their lives. Instead of comparing yourselves going, man, I'm glad I'm not them. What if we actually just got involved in this rescue mission? Because the point is not actually to show them how wrong they are. The point of this is to restore them to God, to to the people who they've maybe harmed because of their sin. So the first is to get involved. The second, what are the signs that we're carrying without comparing is this. Your methods are gentle. You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. I think we would all like to think we're good at this. Truth is, we're not. Some of you are exceptionally gifted at this. One factor, I will say this, that affects how gentle we are is if that person who is in that sin actually hurt us or hurt someone that we love. You want me to lose my gentleness? It's super easy. Offend my wife or hurt my kids. This smile disappears so fast. God hasn't given me the gift of gentleness. Um, And by the way, it's not just a gift, it's a character trait. So we all should possess it. God's given me passion, uh, the gift of thunder sometimes, which comes in help. It it becomes helpful sometimes in parenting. It can get in the way of parenting sometimes. Some of us are wired for this, and some of us aren't. But none of us has the excuse for not being gentle. First, get involved. Help people. Second, be gentle with them. The third sign that you're carrying without comparing is you remain humbly aware of your tremendous capacity to mess up. (laughs) This is what Paul says. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. When you carry another person's burden like trying to help them kick an addiction, it's super easy to look down on their addiction because that's not your temptation, right? You struggle in other things. And I think what Paul is saying is beware that you have a tremendous capacity to get things wrong in another area. Brendan Manning, he was a follower of Jesus, author of the Ragamuffin Gospel. Listen to what he writes. When I get honest, I admit I'm a bundle of paradoxes. I believe and I doubt. I hope and, and get discouraged. I love and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good. I feel guilty about not feeling guilty. I'm trusting and suspicious. I'm honest, and I still play games. Aristotle said I'm a rational animal. I say I'm an angel with an incredible capacity for beer. I love that statement. He goes on to write this. To live by grace means to acknowledge my whole life story, the light side and the dark side. In admitting my shadow side, I learn who I am and what God's grace means. As Thomas Merton put it, a saint is not someone who is good, but who experiences the goodness of God. Listen to that. A saint is not someone who is good, but who experiences the goodness of God. Carry each other's burdens, knowing that there will be a day where someone needs to carry yours. The fourth sign, you strengthen rather than enable. Look at verse 5. It says, for each one should carry their own load. Now, doesn't that seem contradictory? 
I, I mean, he says, listen, I want you to go in and carry the burden that people have. And then he, on the other hand, he says, hey, you know what? Everybody should carry their own load. And it sounds like he's just contradicting, contradicting himself. But if you know the difference between a burden and what he says when he says the word load in the Greek, the word load is like a, a backpack, like a knapsack, like something that is manageable. What he's saying is, you have something to carry. You're responsible. Carry that. That word, though, for burden, it means somebody who is suffering under the weight of their life. It's not just a regular load, backpack, typical responsibilities of life that they carry, but it's somebody who is suffering under the load of their life. And you know what I'm talking about because we've all been there. Here, let me give you a fifth one, final one. What are the signs that you're carrying without comparing? It's this, you belong to a community that rejoices and mourns together. I'm going to step outside of Galatians and step into Romans 12. Listen to this. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. I would invite you, read that verse this week. Romans 12, 15, and 16 is perfectly conjoined with Galatians chapter 6. When you're stuck in the comparison trap, you can't rejoice when something good happens to someone because you look at it and go, oh, wish I had that. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? But here's what's weird. It doesn't allow you to mourn with those who are mourning because when you compare, you're just thinking, I'm glad that's not me. You know what the greater tragedy of all of this is? In Romans 12, 15, he's describing a person who just doesn't belong to a community of people. If you're in the comparison trap, maybe the greatest tragedy is this, is you don't feel like you belong because you're worried about how inferior you feel, how intimidated you feel, or you got to keep the superior feeling above everybody else. And the real tragedy is that you don't know the authenticity of relationships in the room. So let me get real practical for just a moment. So what do we do with this? I don't think getting out of the comparison trap is something that you do in order to start carrying someone else's burden. I think it happens in real time. If you want to get out of the comparison trap, start carrying someone else's burden, but you got to figure out how to do it in a healthy way. So start caring for people. Start doing the five things that we just talked about. But let me give you a few exercises to do this week. Number one is this. These are in your notes. You can reference these later on. Shut down comparison by thanking God for who He made you to be and what it is He's blessed you with. You can do this today. You can do this tomorrow when you wake up. Just when you wake up in the morning, start with, God, thank you for because it's really hard to compare yourself to someone else or feel your value go up or go down when you wake up in the morning with gratitude in your heart for, God, this is how you made me. And God, look at all that I have. Second thing, thank the person who carried your burden. If we've all had burdens, maybe you've been blessed enough that there was a person who walked alongside you. Maybe it was your spouse. Maybe it was a coworker. Maybe it was somebody in your community group, maybe he was a teacher, I don't know, would you just thank that person? I mean, let, let's not just be thankful for them, let's turn around and thank them. Maybe you haven't seen them for 10 years. How great it would be for them to hear from you. Third thing, share your burden so you don't struggle alone. Share your burden so you don't struggle alone. How does this get you out of the comparison trap? I think when we get vulnerable with people to say, this is how I'm struggling, we find a pathway where we truly now belong to a community of people. Belonging and vulnerability go together. Here's the fourth and final thing. Would you gently offer to carry somebody else's burden? I don't know if I have the time. I don't know if I have the money. 
I don't know if I have the emotional capacity to carry more than I am. You won't know unless you try. And I think God's sustaining power in you is that you're stronger than you think you are. And you have this capacity to find strength by carrying other people's burdens. So I gave you five signs, four things that you could do. But instead of picking the one that you think you want to do, can I invite you to let God speak to you and invite God to show you what He wants you to do. So let's pause and pray. Lord, I openly confess today that I fall into the comparison trap. And yet, Lord, I deeply want to belong to a community because I know that's where I thrive. God, I would pray that in this moment that you would speak to those in this room and speak to those who are watching online that, God, there is joy and there is life and there is meaning and there is purpose when we carry each other's burdens, but we got to do it in a healthy way. So God, I pray that we would hear you right now. We would sense your direction and your guidance to speak to the one we need to speak to or open up our vulnerability to say, I need someone to walk with me. And as you reveal it, God, we want to walk in obedience to you. Thank you for meeting us in this time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we uh, wrap things up here in just a moment, let me say two things. Number one, uh, if you're at home right now, uh, there is a prayer button on our website that you can hit, and there is somebody waiting there to pray with you, pray for you, if you have that burden that you want to share and be vulnerable with somebody. Uh, for those of us in this room, uh, there is communion at the, the side tables and the back of the room and even up top in the balcony. Uh, we're going to enter into a time of worship, and if taking communion is something that you would love to celebrate today, feel free to do that.